So welcome to the weekly service from the Ealing Church in the Home Valley. I know that tonight we are going to be blessed. Amen. Amen. We want to extend a special welcome to some students from the Caris Bible College in Colorado who are joining us together with um, Anna and Dieter. Stand up, Anna and Dieter. Anna and Dieter are the directors of the college of the now renamed uh, Caris Bible College Yorkshire uh, with offices in Bradford. Welcome. Some of us know uh, Dieter and Anna for uh, some uh, previous occasions. We've known you a long time. Bless you. Thank you for bringing these folks over to us tonight. And also we want to extend a welcome to members of the congregation at Salby Bridge Church. Some of the students were speaking at uh, the Elim Church there this morning and they were so blessed by it that they thought that they didn't want to miss out tonight. So they've come all the way from Sabi Bridge this evening to be with us. So welcome to you as well. I know that you are going to be blessed as well. And Father, we pray for others close to us, family, friends, colleagues, who need a touch from you tonight, who need to know you as their Lord, their healer, the one who gives them strength, the one who gives them peace, the one who gives them joy. Be everything to everyone at their point of need, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Argal. Amen. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> I usually start with a scripture just to focus us in on the word as we come to worship. Tonight, it is Psalm 126, verse 3. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad. Hallelujah. There is no greater plan than the plan of salvation. It is so awesome. It could only be God's design. Despite the fact that man sinned and turned his back on God, God, because of his great love for mankind, sent Jesus to die on the cross and take the punishment that should have been ours. So now when we turn from our sin and receive Jesus as our Lord and Saviour, we are not only forgiven from our sin, but God fills us with his Holy Spirit. And in our spirit man, we are just like Jesus. Scripture says, 1 Corinthians 6, 17, he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Hallelujah. God has filled this earth with copies of his son. Hallelujah. Now everywhere the enemy looks, he sees Jesus. No wonder the Bible tells us to resist the devil and he will flee from us, James 4, 7. The enemy is terrified of Jesus and Jesus lives in you and you and you and me. Hallelujah. So don't focus on what the enemy is doing to try to hinder you. Focus on what God has already done for you. And as our verse in the Psalms says this evening, let us be glad. Hallelujah. Because God has done great things. Amen. Let's worship him. Praise God.
we thank you that you are so great you have done great things for us lord when we think of all you have done the awesome plan of salvation that you have brought forth to bring us back to yourself to enable us to have that relationship with you to know god himself living in us lord we just thank you we praise you we worship you we honor you we adore you and we lift you high. Hallelujah.
Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy of riches. For now and forevermore. We magnify your name. Glory to your name. Thank you, Jesus. We give you honor. We give you praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We give you glory. We magnify your name. The power of testimony. In a few moments' time, some of the students are going to come and share some testimonies of how God has moved in their lives and changed them. Now, the reason why we give testimonies is to encourage us to accept the truth of God's word. You remember how when the angel Mary, uh, when the angel Gabriel <laughs> appeared to Mary, he told her that she was going to have a baby. How can this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel Gabriel replied with the testimony that Elizabeth, her cousin, in her old age, is going to have a baby. The power of testimony, be it unto me according to your word. The angel Gabriel encouraged Mary to accept the truth of God's word with a testimony. John 4.39 tells us about the lady the, at the well, the, uh, the Samaritan, who went into the Samaritan village afterwards. And the scripture records that she went back and talked about Jesus. And many believed in Jesus because of the word of her testimony. The testimony helps us to and encourages us to accept the word of truth. So without Further ado, who's first up? All right. So as I said, I'm from Juneau, Alaska. Southeast Alaska is in the middle of a rainforest. It's absolutely beautiful. It's surrounded by ice and glaciers and mountains and ocean. In the city that I'm from, there is no road in or out, so you have to fly or take a boat. It's very beautiful. Thank you for your patience. There you go. My parents raised me in a Christian home. They taught me to love God since a young age. I have two siblings, a older brother and an older sister. At the age of 10, um, my parents took a leap of faith and quit their jobs and began to play music full time. Because of their one act of obedience, our family's trajectory took a drastic change. They left the normal nine to five job, listened to God, and stepped out in faith that he was going to provide for them. Our lifestyle of being musicians on the road led to a life filled to the brim with supernatural provision, protection, and miracles. Over the past 15 years, the Lord has taken us on a wild ride across 45 of the states in America, which is 50, and eight different countries across the world, some multiple times. We've played in the lowest of the low, being a Dairy Queen, <laughs> We're like two people, which is just a fast food restaurant to um, festivals in Australia for thousands of people. Um, Psalm 91 became a life verse for our family with the extensive traveling that we did. It says, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him I shall trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler, from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. I want to share just a few stories that stuck out to me as a child, as I remember the miraculous working of God in our lives, and I hope it encourages you. When I was about 13 years old, we were in the state of Texas. Several of our group here today are from Texas. And during a concert, a lady died in the audience. Her heart stopped and her blood stopped circulating. She stopped breathing and she was clinically proven dead. And so we began to pray. We prayed the name of Jesus over her. We began singing a song called Better Farther On. And she was resurrected in the audience. Yes. Amen. Amen. You clap for Jesus, that's the one. <laughs> Mark 16, verse 17 says, And these signs will follow those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. 
They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Another instance, we were in Texas again, and our host was taking us up in his private aircraft. He had the type of plane that had a huge propeller on the back and then a sail on the top. And right as we were taking off, I just kind of jokingly asked, have you ever like crashed this thing? And he was like, no, of course not. I've never crashed this. I've been flying this for 30 years. And so I said a quick prayer and we went up because it's smaller aircraft. Have any of you been on a smaller aircraft? They're a little bit different than like a 747. They're pretty small. And so we got up to altitude. We were flying. It was beautiful. And it died. And she had to make an emergency landing. And he's freaking out and, and maneuvering whatever he's doing in order to fly the plane. He makes an emergency landing, gets the aircraft into a field, and we're fine. Not a scratch. We pack up the plane. <laughs> We get back to his house, and it's there that I trip in the parking lot and just skin all of the skin off of my knees. <laughs> so I think God can save you from airplane crashes, but he might not be able to save you from being a klutz. <laughs> we were in Australia, and we had a beautiful host who was a chef. And he had this beautiful restaurant on the water, and he served all kinds of seafood, and he was a beautiful person. He set us down with this just gorgeous special meal just for us. And he was standing there, and he had just set it down, he was ready for us to partake of it, and we stopped, and we took hands as a family, and we prayed, and we blessed him. And we thought nothing of that. That's just normal, as I'm sure most of you have a, an amazing prayer walk with God. And it wasn't about until a year later that he messaged us and said, because of your family's one prayer, I accepted Christ in that moment. And so your guys' actions and obedience to God are powerful. And you may not ever hear about it. And I'm so thankful that I got to hear of that man's salvation because I'm going to meet him in heaven one day. But I got to hear about it now and I'm encouraged. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma of death leading to death and to the other the aroma of life leading to life. And the last one I want to mention, which I didn't mention this morning when it came to me right when I was sitting here, is that same song that we sang over the woman who was resurrected in the concert, Better Farther On. We heard, and I don't remember all of the details, but someone messaged us one day on the internet, and he, through a tragic loss, had lost his daughter, and she had had a baby, and he was caring for that baby, and the baby had Down syndrome. And the whole story was very tragic, and the baby was in terrible pain and crying all of the time, and the baby would stop crying when he would play that YouTube video. And he, no matter what he would do, he'd be up all hours of the night just rocking that baby, and it would be screaming, and he'd turn on that worship song, and it would stop crying. And with my last two minutes, is you might be asking, have I ever even seen a bad day? Because this sounds absolutely amazing. And the answer is yes, I've seen terrible days. We live in a fallen world and many bad, bad things can happen. But I'm not here to tell you about those things. I'm here to boast about Christ and what he has done. Because in my life, he's been faithful. He's been trustworthy. He's set me free. He has healed me. He has redeemed me. And he has restored my family through many times where in the world's eyes it would have seemed that we would never have been able to make it through those times. And my very last verse is Psalm 139. O oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all of my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O oh Lord, you know it altogether. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. 
Or where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, for the night shines as the day, and the darkness and the light are both alike to you. And my summarizing statement is that God is faithful. <laughs> All the time. Can you say that to me? God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Thank you. And um, I was asked to sing a song, Great is Thy Faithfulness, and um, I would encourage you to read the word with me. Good evening, everyone. My name is Patricia, and tonight I'm going to be sharing with you about uh, unworthiness. And I know all of us have faced those uh, situations sometimes in our life. 
But, to, but when they were making a comment, when our uh, leader was making a comment today about unworthiness, it was like, I don't like to share this part of my life, and I have never shared it publicly. But uh, it's like the Holy Spirit went like this, if you've ever felt unworthiness. So here I am to share <laughs> unworthiness. <laughs> but, you know, first I want to share that I am totally healed from this, these unworthiness feelings because God has delivered me. Thank God I have been delivered, and He has set me free by His love and the revelation of spirit, soul, and body and a great foundation on how much He loves me. I know that there's nothing that I can do that... that or, or someone can do to me that will make me feel unworthy ever again. But anyway, when I was, uh, uh, this first scripture I wanted to share with you is, uh, it was Ephesians. In Philippians 3, 13 through 15, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it on my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the Goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that to you also. And that's what he has done for me. But anyway, uh, the unworthiness feelings began when I was a, a young child. And uh, uh, there, I, I was raised in a home of uh, domestic violence and child abuse and sexual abuse, and uh, my, I had four sisters, and uh, my, my, my stepdad was a truck driver, and I always thanked God when he was gone, because then there was no, no domestic violence or abuse, but, so that was, that was kind of nice, but uh, then as I, I hated it at home so much when I was growing up that I got married when I was 15 and had twin boys when I was 17, and then divorced at 19. And, and then uh, I, I got remarried, and I was married for 23 years, and my uh, husband had a serious problem with pornography. And because of that, you know, he, he just didn't want to get any healing for that. He didn't want to come to the Lord for that. And his, his dad was a, uh, a, a, a preacher's son. And so that made it any hard, even harder that he was not willing to get help to keep you know, the marriage together and keep our, our children together. So, and that just made me feel more and more unworthy as those times went on like that. But I did get some emotional healing, and uh, the Lord took care of me all along the way, and not only me, but my children, because my children were the ones that I was the most concerned for, that uh, they would be raised without a father and they wouldn't have that, that uh, needed father experience in their life. But uh, God was with me the whole way and, and most of the time I didn't even know it. I was saved when I was 17 and baptized in the Holy Spirit when I was 19 and, and God's just been so good to me all along the way. But then, you know, I, I wasn't raised in a, in a religious home and then when I did start going to church after I was saved, I, it, was all, it was all religion. And so I ended up uh, always feeling like I, like I was always doing something wrong. I was always making bad choices. I could never do the right thing. And then uh, uh, finally I went to a church where they had a, uh, emotional healing classes and, and things like that. And that really helped me a lot. But then more than that, Going to Karis, uh, I got a revelation of spirit, soul, and body, and the love of God, and the love of God more than anything else, knowing that, that there is nothing you can do that is going to, that, that he's not going to love me. And so uh, there's another scripture that I wanted to share with you in Romans 8:32 uh, through 39. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And he has freely given us his love, and he's freely given us everything that we have from deliverance to salvation. And so I just stand amazed at how good our, our, our Father is and how wonderful Jesus was to take that sacrifice of all the sins and bad choices and bad habits that we had. He took them to the cross, and he saved us, and he delivered us. And he set us free 
from things that torment us in our life. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? There's no one. Only the enemy comes to try to deceive us and to make us live in condemnation. But that word of God says there is now no, con- no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So I don't stand condemned anymore. It is God who justifies. It's God who justifies us. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. And so he is right now sitting at the right hand of the Father ever to make intercession for every single one of our needs, whether it be emotional, whether it be physical, or whether it be deliverance. He's, he's, he's there for us. He's making intercession for us. He cares about every situation that happens in our lives. But we just have to recognize that. We just have to, ex- we just have to receive that from him. And, to, and until we can receive him, receive those gifts that he's given us, we will live in torment. So, so, uh, so he's there to ever make an intercession for us. Who shall separate us from, his, from the love of Christ? There's no one who can separate us from the love of Christ. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in these things we are more than conquerors. There's not anything that we can't overcome in Christ. But we are in Christ. We are sitting right up there in him on the throne with Jesus. We are there with him. And so we don't have to think about these things that that have disturbed us in the past. We can move on to the high calling that Christ has called us to. We don't have to live in the past anymore. I mean, that's why they make a rear view mirror small and a windshield big, because we're supposed to be looking forward to the things that God has for us. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so as long as we keep our focus on Him and His love for us, we can overcome any situation in our life, no matter how devastating it may be or how much torment it has put us through in the, in the past. And I don't even look at that anymore. And actually, talking about it, I don't even know that person because that person doesn't exist anymore. God has set me free. And I'm so happy about that. And if anything, I would just admonish you to you know, continue in the Word because if we continue in the Word, we are His disciples indeed. And once we know the Word, the Word is what sets us free. And, he's, and, and Jesus is the Word. So we have to get that Word in our heart, though. If we don't get that Word in our heart and believe that what the Word of God says is truth, we'll never be healed. If we don't know what God has said, how can we know what we don't know? Amen? Amen. Okay. Thank you. And... Hi. Is this on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So my name is Dustin. Um, of course, I'm from the States, more specifically Texas. Um, and tonight, I'm actually going to be sharing with you about unforgiveness, and more importantly, leading that to forgiveness. Um, and a scripture that I want to start with tonight is Psalm 10, and it's uh, verse 14. And it says, but you have seen, for you observe, trouble and grief, to repay it by your hand. The helpless commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. And that's what I'm going to speak on tonight, is how God brought me through the unforgiveness that I carried from my father. You see, when I grew up, uh, my parents divorced uh, as soon as I was born, practically. Um, and unfortunately for them, they carry a lot of hate in their heart toward each other. Um, And unfortunately for me growing up, they carried that into the family. And so I was in and out of court all throughout my life with my family. Um, And at age 11, there were some really traumatic events that happened in my life. 
And it, that was when my relationship with my father ended. And the way he handled things uh, was, was not right. And so, um, like I said, our relationship ended, and it, it just continuously uh, got worse. Um, and at age 15, he gave up his rights legally as my father. Um, and he did it while he looked me in the face in the courtroom. Um, and then went on to blame me for him doing it. Um, and so, as you can imagine, walking through that, I carried a lot of shame and a lot of unforgiveness. In fact, I carried a lot of hatred and bitterness in my heart toward him. And it took many years. Um, I came to the Lord at 24. I'm now 30. And it took, uh, well, about like four years for me to walk through this journey with the Lord and all I can tell you is that walking through that unforgiveness and carrying it in my heart, it actually tormented me. It actually caused me to lose sleep. Every time I would think about my father, it would put me in a bad mood and I would just go off on tangents. Um, and it only hurt me because I'm not even in, in relationship with my father. And so it would only cause me distress. And so as I would continue to walk through this, and we all know that the Lord is so loving and he's so patient. And he was so patient with me as I would walk through this journey. And for a while, I just refused to forgive him. I absolutely refused. And um, one day, I was driving down the road, and the Lord spoke to me. He loves to speak to me when I'm driving. And so the Lord spoke to me, and he told me that my father was never loved. And it was because he was never loved that he never knew how to love me. And in that moment, I did not accept that. I was like, Lord, you're making an excuse for him. I don't want to hear it. I'm not giving him any excuses. He does not deserve my forgiveness. No, I don't accept that. And so the Lord just brought that back to my mind. And I was faced with a decision. I could either accept what the Lord was telling me as a reason and an opportunity to forgive. Or I could stay in unforgiveness and allow myself to suffer for it. And so in realizing that my father never knew forgiveness, I was able to forgive him. I was able to let him go. And, you know, forgiveness doesn't mean that you're going to be reconciled. It doesn't mean that there's going to be an established relationship. And I do not have a relationship with my father today. However, I do have peace in my heart. And when I think about my father, I no longer get angry. I'm no longer bitter. I no longer think about everything that he did wrong. In fact, I'm, I'm able to pray for him. And I do have hope. <laughs> in fact, uh, I was at a men's retreat. Um, this was prior to me even forgiving my father. And part of that retreat was... You go into the woods, and you sit by yourself, and you sit with God. And you either read scripture, or you just hear from God whatever he has for you. And um, I was sitting there, and the Lord goes, I'm going to reconcile your relationship with your father. And I said, you have fun with that. <laughs> I'm not interested. I don't want it. Um, and you know... At that time, I didn't want it. I didn't want anything to do with him. And now my prayer for him is that he does get saved. And I think it would be awesome to, to have a reconciled relationship with him, whatever that may look like. That's in the Lord's timing. But one thing through that forgiveness that has happened is that my relationship with God has deepened. It has grown more intimate. And God is my father. And, you know, I think that that's such a huge part because that also is what allowed me to forgive, is that I knew that God loved me so much, and I know that God is my Father. And because of that, I, I have no expectation on my earthly father. So I'm released from that, and I'm able to just stand in the gap for him and pray for him and have hope for his future. Like I said, I haven't talked to him since I was 11, but I just know that uh, if God said that he's going to reconcile that relationship, then God's going to reconcile that relationship. I'm glad I'm on board. <laughs> um, but 
my encouragement tonight is that forgiveness, um, it's a saying that we have in the States, and I'm sure you say it over here, is uh, when you have unforgiveness in your heart, it's like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. That's exactly what it is. My father did not suffer for my unforgiveness. My father didn't suffer when I had torment in my heart and in my soul, when I lost sleep, when I was mad and angry. But I was able to get rid of all of that by forgiving him and walk now in peace and just have that freedom in my soul because I was able to forgive him. And so again, I just encourage, if there's any, anyone who might have unforgiveness toward anybody, I think the number one thing that we can focus on is one, God loves us so much. And two, that because of what Jesus did, we can forgive. I have been forgiven for many things. And the word says that he who is forgiven of much loves much. And I have been forgiven of many, many, many things. And I'm sure that we all have. And so again, I just encourage you that if you do have unforgiveness, take it to the Lord and allow him to walk with you hand in hand and to bring healing and peace to you through forgiveness. Thank you. And so, well, guys, I just want to say this has been such an honor to spend this time with each one of you. My name is Don, and um, I really feel like the Lord is just in emphasizing a theme for us tonight, and that is the love of the Father. You know, if we think back to Abigail's testimony, what did we hear? That God is faithful, that he can be counted on with whatever we're facing or going through. He is able to make a way. He's able to help us right where we are. He can be counted on again and again. What did we hear from Patricia? She went through things that tried to mark her, tried to cause her to adopt an identity that she was somehow less than, somehow not good enough. But because she had a heavenly father, she was able to overcome all of the things that she experienced. And she began to find worth and value in Him. And that empowered her to love others. It empowered her to not be just another story of someone who's had something bad happen to them. Here she is giving glory to God. And then we think of Dustin. And what a beautiful capstone. He talked about his relationship with his earthly father. And yet, what stood before you here today was a son, a beloved son who knows the love of his father and is able to share that love with others, able to not only forgive himself for the wrong that he's done, but to have the grace to forgive someone that really should have loved him better. And so here we are. And I just want to encourage you guys with a number of scriptures today that just highlights the love of the Father. He is for you guys. And so I want to share just a, a brief scripture here with you guys. How many of you guys have had an encounter with the love of God? Yeah? Amen. Well, you know, I was someone who used to sit in the seats just like you and, and I'd ask a, or have a question like that asked to me for years and I didn't actually have an encounter with God's love until 2018, just a few years ago. And I'd been saved for maybe 11 years at that time. But it was when I encountered the love of God for myself and when I began to recognize that my Heavenly Father is for me, it changed everything. Knowing God as your Father and knowing that He loves you, it means that you are adequate. Check this out. We find this in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, verse 5. I don't know if you guys have ever looked around and like our friends who shared tonight, recognize that there's some things about yourself that maybe you're not too pleased by. Am I talking to anyone out there? Yeah? Things that you wish were a little better, or maybe even you'd go as far as I did and maybe say there's some things that disqualify me, things that make me not enough. 
But listen to what your Father says about you. 2 Corinthians 3, 5. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. Another translation says our adequacy is from God. Having an encounter with the love of God for me, it was almost like, well, the way it happened for me, I was in a a time of prayer. And I sensed the Lord's presence was with me, much like He is with you guys here. And it was almost like a hand reached into my spine right here. And it's like He gave me a spine. That's exactly the picture I had in my heart. It was like He reached into my back and He put something in there. And what the Lord revealed to me later on is that His love has become the backbone of my life. In Him, I can be uh, adequate. I can be affirmed, approved. I can know in my knower. Even if no one else agrees, and if no one else sees, I'm enough. Because He has made me enough. He has done everything necessary for me and for you to enjoy life and godliness. God delights in you. He loves you. He's for you. He's in your corner. And your heavenly Father is proud. He's so proud. If you're not convinced, which I know sometimes it takes time, because it took time for me, and I'm in the same boat as you, we see here Jesus gave us some insight into what the Father is like. You guys love Jesus here? Yeah? We've all heard of Jesus? Yeah? Amen? John 14 and uh, verse 9, we have this exchange taking place. Jesus is wrapping things up, and he's giving his disciples some need-to-know information. And uh, we see, I'll start here in verse 7. It says, if you had known me, this is John 14, 7, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Mic drop, close the book, let's go home, right? Well, the disciples weren't so convinced. We go on in verse 8. Philip said to them, Lord, show us the Father and it is sufficient for us. Just just show us your dad and we'll be fine. Jesus was confused. Why was he confused? Because he and his Father are one. And as we learn later on, You and I, we are also one in the Father because Christ is in us and that's the hope of glory. And now we too are children of God. And so we can enjoy that same privilege of saying, if you've seen me, if you've seen my friends, you've seen our Father. And that's what we found as we have traveled so far across your beautiful country is we've been running into God everywhere we've gone. Brothers and sisters who look like our Father, who love the way He does. And so Jesus continues here and He says, Jesus said to him, Have I been so long with you and yet you have not known Me, Philip? He who has seen Me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in Me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak of My own authority, But the Father who dwells in me does the works. And what did Jesus show us? He showed us a God that loved us. Greater love hath no man than he uh, he lay down his life for his friends. God, in the form of Jesus, gave his life for us so that we would know for certain that God loves us. God is for us. And God has equipped us to do the things that my friends explained tonight. Things that are impossible. Jesus left us with a command. And I love this. Do you guys celebrate Christmas out here? Do you guys have Christmas? Okay. Amen. Christmas is awesome. Well, if you ever need a beautiful verse for Christmas services, this is the one, I assure you. This is John 13. 34 and 35. And uh, man, this is one that I love to come to time and again, especially for families. And uh, Christmas is a great time where families come together. John 13 
And uh, we'll see here in 34, 35, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as they have loved you. No? No? Okay. Oh, you're right. It doesn't say that, does it? It says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. I love that. Because what that highlights to us, and I love Dustin's story, I think it captures it so well, is that we don't give to others what they have given to us. We give to others what Jesus has given to us. And so in every setting, in every opportunity and situation, we get to manifest the love of the Father. We get to show others what God has done for us. He who has been forgiven much, loves much. And guys, that's us. That's each one of us. Our Father has gone above and beyond to demonstrate time and again that He's for us, that He's forgiven us, that He wants a deep relationship with us. And because we receive that as sons and daughters, it empowers us to love others also. Even the ones who really don't deserve it. (laughs) The ones who have not been the most kind. Knowing who our Father is, it's a secret uh, power to give them something they haven't earned. To share with them something that we didn't earn. And I think that's just beautiful. One more scripture I want to share with you guys. Has this been a blessing to you so far? Yeah? Amen. Guys, this has just been such an honor to share with you guys. But I want to share one more scripture here that I think just is a beautiful picture of really where we all in our hearts need to come to terms with. This is Mark 4. It's a, it's a story, or rather an account, that we have in the scriptures. And it speaks volumes Um, As they say in the States, when the rubber meets the road. And this is one of those times when the disciples, they were faced with that. This is Mark 4, verse 35. We'll read to the end. On the same day when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Jesus was speaking, and he gave a very clear command. Hey, let's go over there. There were no questions asked, so we can assume the disciples understood what the goal would be that day. So they could continue. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose, rebuked the wind, said to the sea, Peace be still. The wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Isn't it interesting? Here is his disciples, and they had been with him all this time, and they had seen the many great things that he has done. And faced with this dilemma, where the winds are blowing and the waves are crashing against their boat and even filling their boat. Isn't it interesting that they didn't start with Jesus, are you not able to calm this storm? Are you not capable of protecting us? What did they jump to in their hearts? Do you not care? Don't you see Are you so insensitive? Are you blind to our pain? What they were actually acknowledging is that they didn't know how much He loved them. When pushed, when faced with the storm of their life, they didn't think about whether or not He was capable. They knew His power. They weren't convinced that He really would use it for them, that that He loved them, at least in that moment. Guys, you know God is powerful. You know that He's strong and that He has done many works of old. And I just believe in my heart that tonight, for all of us, for our visitors, for our team, for your home, 
Guys, let us remember our Father loves us. And He's not withholding any good thing from you. Only good gifts come from our Father of light. And He loves you. And He sees you. And whatever storm you're facing, He's not only in the boat with you, but His love is for you. And He's more than able to calm that storm. And it's because He loves you that He does it. And so I believe that that's just the message we have for you guys. Remember, God is faithful. You are valuable. Are you not worth many more than these sparrows as another parable would go? And remember that you are forgiven and loved because you have a heavenly Father who is for you. And so we love you guys. We're brothers and sisters from across the big pond just to come over here and say that our Father is good over there too. And we've enjoyed this time with you. I hope you guys have a blessed night. Thanks, Pastor. So we're... So we're glad that you've been able to join us this week. Uh, if you've not been able to join us live, we have missed you. We've prayed for you and we hope to see you again very, very soon. If you want to call me uh, this week, you can do so on 01484 323 978. If you want to text me, it's 0747 277 3243. If you want to email me this week, it's info at hvelim.org. Dot UK. It's not home groups this week. I've forgotten the date of the next cafe groups. It'll come on the screen just below you just now. So it's not home groups this week, but the week after next. And don't forget our evangelistic outreach event at the Liberal Club on March the 31st, seven o'clock with Barry Woodward. Start thinking about who you're going to bring to that evangelistic event, because I know that people are going to be saved on that occasion. Well, haven't we have had a great evening. We have been blessed, blessed by the best. We'll see you again next week. Bye for now.